الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى خصوصا على أفضلهم وخاتم النبيين محمد الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعد We begin with Allah's blessed name We praise Him and we glorify Him as He ought to be praised and glorified And we pray for peace and for blessings on all His noble messengers And in particular on the last of them all the Blessed Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam Today's session is one in which we seek to introduce Islamic eschatology strange word strange word or ilmu akhiru zaman everybody knows that and we begin by asking some questions. <coughs> These are important questions. And they require answers. But before we ask the questions, let us turn to the Quran, to Surah Al-Nahl of the Quran, with which you are all familiar. Anytime Imran Hussein speaks, he always goes to this verse of the Quran. فَعَلَهُذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ وَنَزَّلْنَا عَلَيْكَ الْكِتَابَ تِبْيَانًا لِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ وَهُدًا وَرَحْمَةً وَبُشْرَى لِلْمُسْلِمِينَ صدق الله العظيم And we sent down the book. Sent it down on thee, O Muhammad صلى الله تعالى عليه وسلم that this book might explain all things that this book might explain all things. And in this book there is guidance. But explanation and that guidance have come from above as Rahma, an act of kindness. And for those who turn to the book to seek that explanation and guidance and accept it and follow it, good news, blood tidings for them, they will understand what others cannot. And they will succeed when others will not. And so with that statement of the Quran, that the Quran explains all things, let us proceed to ask some disturbing questions. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran has described one land, one part of the earth, as the Holy Land, a land which is specially blessed by Allah for all of mankind. Some people call it Palestine, but the Quran does not use that name. No, the Quran says, Al Abdul Muqaddas, the Holy Land. And in that Holy Land, Nabi Dawood alayhi salam established the holy state of Israel. And Nabi Sulaiman alayhi salam built the masjid. And that masjid is in the Quran. Masjid al-Aqsa. And the Quran recognizes that state of Israel as a ruling state in the world. When you look at the story with the queen of Saba. <coughs> no combination of powers in the world could stand up to Suleiman alayhi salam. But then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroyed in the masjid. And he says so in the Quran. At the beginning of who can help me? With surah. No, no, not you. Who can help me? 
with soda. You're not going to sit down here today and get away. Where Allah speaks of the destruction of the masjid with surah. Nobody? All right, Muhammad. Surah al Isra. Surah al Correct. Surah number 17. Okay. He destroyed the masjid. He destroyed the state of Israel. Not once, but twice. And then he tells us that he expelled them. Not just that he expelled the Jews, but he tells us that he cut them up into bits and pieces and scattered them all over the world. <laughs> if you're unfamiliar, read Jerusalem in the Quran. Now then, that was 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years later, strangely and mysteriously, Banu Israel are back in the Holy Land. Did this happen by accident? Or is there something which explains the return of the Jews to the Holy Land, to Jerusalem, to reclaim it as their own? Do the Christians have an answer for that question? Do the Jews have an answer for that question? Do we as Muslims have an answer to that question? Does the Quran provide an answer to that question. 2,000 years after the holy state of Israel was destroyed by Allah, divine command. He used first a Babylonian army and then he used secondly a Roman army <laughs> and the masjid is destroyed. The masjid was lying in ruin when Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam went on the Mi'raj. But 2,000 years later, strangely and mysteriously, I mean you have to be living on the moon not to know it, that the state of Israel has been restored in the Holy Land and we ask a question. And we want an answer. Is there an explanation? Does the Quran and does the Ahadith of Nabi Muhammad provide an answer? 2,000 years after, or more than 2,000, sorry, after the holy state of Israel created by Nabi Dawood alayhi salam and over which Nabi Suleiman alayhi salam presided and made the ruling state in the world. 2,000 years later or far more than 2,000 years later a state of Israel in the holy land is now poised poised in our opinion, and there are many people who agree with me, not just Muslims, poised to replace the United States of America as the ruling state in the world. Is there something that explains it? So is this happening by accident? We waited long enough for answers. We can wait no more. It is time enough for us to be able to turn to the Quran and turn to Nabi Muhammad to locate the answers which explain the subject. And we are very pleased and happy to be in Brunei. I am not, those who know me, 
I'm not a person who flatters people. No. That's not my style. But I'm happy to be in Brunei, where you have a sultan <clears throat> who is calling for Islam. Publicly calling for the enforcement of Islamic law. So this is an important moment in history. And uh, Sultan needs help. The people must respond to his call and support him. And part of the process of supporting him to bring back Islam is in Islamic eschatology. Because the questions which I have just asked, oh, well, let me ask some more questions to tickle your intellect, to trouble your heart a little bit more than I've already troubled it. <laughs> is it by accident that one global society is emerging all around the world? Huh? All of mankind becoming interconnected. All of mankind living essentially the same way of life. A global society. They call it globalization. Is this by accident? No. You enter into a, an apartment building in Brunei. And you see exactly the same thing that you would see in downtown Los Angeles. Huh? Or you go to China and the apartment building is built the same way. Huh? One architecture. You want to go to shop to get some groceries and you have something called a supermarket. When we were children, there were no supermarkets in the world. Huh? You have an Indonesian maid working in the home as a maid, paid, of course, the salary of a slave, what's new. But she has a cellular phone in her pocket. <laughs> and she's calling back home. <laughs> a whole global society emerging before our very eyes where all of mankind are becoming interconnected and living essentially the same way of life for purposes of communication for example is this by accident or is there an explanation if you say it's by accident I'll buy a one-way ticket for you to the moon <laughs> Is it by accident that the world of women today is acting in a very strange way? Very strange way. When I was a child, a boy, long, long, long ago, we never saw a girl in blue jeans. No. If we had seen a woman or a girl in blue jeans, we'd say the sky is falling down. No. Because women dress like women. And men dress like men. And now we live in the embrace of a feminist revolution, which is sweeping the world in which women are dressing like men and uh, men are moving in that direction as well to dress like women because of course the first thing a man has to do you know what if he wants to dress as a woman to attract another man well, shave off the bed you can be angry with me now but after the lecture we'll be friends <laughs> Is this by accident that women are now dressed and yet naked? Or is there something which explains the feminist revolution? Disturbing questions I'm asking. And we want answers. We are not going to allow you to sit down silently anymore. 
We demand answers. You have to give us answers. And if the answers are there in the Quran and in the Ahadith of the Prophet Muhammad we ask Allah most kind to open the doors that those answers may reach the people. And he has been opening the doors. Alhamdulillah. We live in a strange economy today, isn't it? Where wealth no longer circulates through the economy. No. Around the world today, the rich are now permanently rich forever and ever and ever and ever. And the poor are imprisoned in permanent poverty and moving to destitution forever and ever and ever and ever. Is this happening by accident? One part of the world on the gravy train and the rest of mankind moving to slavery. Is this happening by accident? I can go on, you know. But I think that these are questions which demand answers. And I want to say to you that the only, only one who can answer these questions, the only person who can answer these questions, the only one, the only human being who can answer these questions is Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Only one human being. The Christians have some answers. The Jews have some answers. But we have all the answers because of our Prophet And the answers are located in this branch of knowledge. In Mu'akhir al-Zaman or Islamic eschatology. So this is my introduction to suggest to you that this is indeed an important branch of knowledge and we ought to direct attention to study it. Hmm. Let us now make a distinction between the end of the world. Your chairman doesn't know when the world is going to end. I don't know when the world is going to end. Okay? And Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam said to the angel Gabriel alayhi salam, he said, the one who is being questioned has no more knowledge of this than the one who is questioning. So we are not dealing with the end of the world, not in this subject. The end of the world is different from what we now call the end of history. Francis Fukuyama didn't know when he used that term how convenient it would be for us to borrow it from him. What is the end of history? And how does it differ from the end of the world? The Quran informs us that history is going to end with the triumph of truth over all rivals. Who are the arsala rasoolahu bil huda wa deen al the truth must always, time and again, triumph over all rivals. And history therefore cannot end with the final conclusive triumph of truth over falsehood and over all rivals. That triumph of truth over all rivals is the end of history. That triumph of truth over all rivals from our perspective will come when the true Messiah returns to Jerusalem. The Christians say the same thing. The Christians say that the final triumph over truth of truth over all rivals will come when the true Messiah returns to Jerusalem. Exactly the same answer. And the Jews say almost the same thing. 
world history will end when the Messiah comes to Jerusalem. We say return. The Christians say return. But the Jews drop the word return. So all three, all three, Islam, Christianity, and Judaism, have an almost identical viewpoint on how history will end. Namely, that the Messiah will come to Jerusalem. For us, the Messiah is Nabi Isa alayhi salam. For the Christians, the Messiah is Nabi Isa alayhi salam. But not for the Jews. The Quran says, فَآمَنَ الطَّائِفَةُ مِنْ بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلَ وَكَفَرَ الطَّائِفَةُ Some of the Jews believed that he was indeed the Messiah when he came the first time. <coughs> but the rabbis, the establishment, and the majority rejected him. And you know the reasons why they rejected him. So they're waiting for the Messiah to come. Oh, this is a divine promise. And when the Messiah comes, he will rule the world from Jerusalem. And that will be the triumph of Judaism and the validation of the Jewish claim to truth. There's something else about the end of history. I have been, because I was blessed to live in New York for 10 years prior to 9-11, from 1991 to 2001, and to have extensive interaction with Jewish and Christian scholars while I was in New York. It's very rare for a Muslim scholar to get a chance to interact with Jewish scholars. Very rare. My interest in this subject and my study of the subject proceeded during these 10 years in New York and since then. So I have been with this subject for more than 20 years now. And as a result of my study of the subject, I have come to the conclusion that the return of the true Messiah is not far from now. No. Of course, when we give an opinion, only Allah does not make mistakes. And when we give an opinion out of respect for truth, and because we want to get good students, not gramophone records, we urge our students, do not accept my opinion until you have first carefully studied it. And only when you are convinced that it is correct, only then do you accept it. And so the scholars of Islam would always say, when they give an opinion, they will say, Allah Allah knows this. I came to the conclusion that we are probably about 20 to 30 years away from the return of the true Messiah. And when we look across there in the world of Christianity, you would see that the whole Christian world is agitated today. And they are expecting the imminent return of Jesus, alayhi salam. So they also hold the same view. And when you go to the world of Judaism, and listen to what the rabbis are saying, it's the same thing. They believe that the Messiah is around the corner. So there is a confluence of all three faiths here on this subject. What Islamic eschatology does is to go to specific verses of the Quran and to a hadith of Nabi Muhammad 
and seek to apply and seek to interpret those verses, sometimes for the first time ever, so that they explain the existing reality in the world today. Before I pause to ask your questions on what has so far been presented, let me give you an example of what Islamic eschatology can do. The Christians accuse the Jews of the ultimate crime, to kill God himself. You can't do worse than that. And so between Christianity and Judaism, there was always enmity and hostility and hatred. And yet today, Christians and Jews have come together in Europe. A Jewish-Christian alliance has emerged. The bond between them is called Zionism today. But Zionism is a term which only recently emerged, the last hundred years. But the Christian-Jewish bond was there before. Imagine my surprise. I didn't know it. Until we had a session in KL about three weeks ago. And Dr. Omar Said, who is a specialist in this field, a Christian missionary who became a Muslim, he told me, that, and there is evidence to support it, that the Jews financed the Crusades. I didn't know. So there was collusion between Christians and Jews long before the Zionist movement was created a hundred years ago. That Jewish-Christian alliance, that Zionist alliance, today rules the world. They control the United States. They control President Obama. They control the U.S. Congress. <laughs> it is that Judeo-Christian alliance which controls the United Nations, which controls uh, not absolute control of course, the International Monetary Fund. Is that Jewish Christian alliance which has given us today's monetary system of paper money and tomorrow's system of electronic money? And it is that Jewish Christian alliance which worked for the liberation of the Holy Land for the Jews, for the restoration of a state of Israel in the Holy Land, and which has protected that state of Israel and caused it to grow and grow and grow and grow until today it is on the verge of becoming the ruling state in the world. Is there anything in the Quran which explains this phenomenon of a Jewish Christian friendship and alliance, reconciliation between the two? Is there anything in the Quran? If you go to the books of Tafsir, they could not at that time understand what we can understand today when the events have already unfolded. And so I want to introduce to you this pivotally important verse of the Quran in Surah Al-Ma'idah. Some of you may have already heard me speaking on it. And after I finish presenting this verse of the Quran, we'll pause for a while. Allah speaks in the Quran in Surah Al-Ma'idah, verse number 51. And He says, يا أيها الذين آمنوا لا تخ لا تتخذ اليهود والنصارى أولياء. Oh you who have faith in Allah, do not take the Jews and do not take the Christians as your friends and allies. And now we are presented with the problem of methodology. If we use the defective methodology, then we'll study this verse by itself in isolation. Or well, the Americans call it standalone. And we'll come to the wrong conclusion that Allah is speaking about all Christians and all Jews. 
do not take all Christians and all Jews as your friends and allies. But if you use the correct methodology, which Allah himself has taught at the beginning of the Quran, but we don't have the time now to teach it. And we go to the whole of the Quran, then the evidence is clear as daylight. And we don't have the time to give it an evidence today. That no, Allah could not be speaking about all Jews and all Christians. That is wrong. Well then, if he's not talking about all Jews and all Christians, which Jews and which Christians? And from the time we ask that question, the answer is right there in the words which follow. La tattakhidu al-Yahuda wal-Nasara awliya And then the words which now follow, Ba'aduhum awliya uba' Meaning, do not take such Jews and do not take such Christians as your friends and allies, who themselves are friends and allies of each other. Allah is not speaking about an individual Christian who has a Jew as his neighbor. No. That's not proper application of the words. He's talking about an alliance of Jews and Christians. When that alliance emerges, and the Quran is anticipating it, then you are prohibited by the Quran from being friends and allies of that Jewish Christian alliance. That Jewish Christian alliance emerged in Europe. The Vatican played a strategically important role in bringing about that reconciliation and paving the way for that alliance. It is that Jewish Christian alliance today which we call the Zionist alliance. Okay, and this is the Quran, 1400 years ago, explaining to us something that is to occur. And if we neglect the Quran, we pay the price for it. But the Quran goes on to say something more. وَمَنْ يَتَوَلَّهُمْ مِنْكُمْ فَإِنَّهُ مِنْهُمْ Whosoever from amongst you turn to them with friendship and alliance, you now belong to them. You lost your Islam. A brother from Libya wrote to me about a week ago. He was so angry, shake him round. How can you be like this? How can you criticize us? When we worked such a miracle and we overthrew that awesome dictator and you are criticizing us, are you a supporter of him? After about two or three emails that we exchanged with each other, and he understood for the first time this verse of the Quran. That same brother turned around now and recognized the mistake that they made in Libya in making an alliance with NATO because NATO or the North Atlantic Treaty Organization is a Zionist movement. It's a Zionist alliance. It is a military wing of the Zionist movement. And now that same Libyan brother, who one week ago was throwing stones at me, <laughs> is now providing me with information that will be helpful to me when next I lecture on the subject. Alhamdulillah for that. Woman yet a wallahu minkum fa in no minhum. 
whosoever from amongst you turn to them with friendship and alliance now belong to them you've lost your Islam in Allah surely Allah does not provide guidance for people who have this as their trademark the Zionist movement full of a people of wickedness of oppression here is a stunning example an absolutely stunning example of a verse of the Quran explaining the world today and providing us with absolutely strategic importance a verse of strategic importance for us to understand what is happening in the world today and what we can expect tomorrow so let us pause now we've shown you given you an introduction so far and let us hear your questions and your comments yes this looks like can someone take the microphone to him please we don't want to lose the question uh, this uh, looks like that the verse is uh, uh, related with the uh, government, like governments uh, can have alliance and all these things. So how this is applicable to the individuals? Um, an individual who makes friend with another individual a Jew or a Christian and of course you will not make a friend of someone who is your enemy no you will not make a friend of someone who is hostile to Islam you will not make a friend of someone in whose heart there is hatred for Islam no so this verse does not prohibit you from having a Christian as your friend. We may even have some Christians here in this gathering. This verse does not prohibit you from having a Jew as a friend. But this verse does prohibit you from maintaining friendly ties with those who belong to that alliance. We, why, why did you say that? Yeah. We um, wanted to organize a Jewish Christian Muslim dialogue on signs of the last day at the University of Cape Town in South Africa four years ago. You you were there? Yes. Okay, he was there. Four years ago. And a Christian bishop, white white Christian bishop South Africa, he accepted the invitation to represent Christianity. A very dignified man, a learned man. And then when our, my students approached the Jews, they were choosing a rabbi. But I said, I will not sit on the same stage and dialogue, in a friendly dialogue, with any rabbi who is a supporter of the state of Israel. So I want you to ask the rabbi, what are his views about Israel? And from the time my students began to question, the Jews backed out. They said, this is not a religious forum, this is a political forum. <laughs> so they backed out. Why? Because I was not prepared to sit down on the same platform and engage in a friendly dialogue with any supporter of the state of Israel. Eventually, the dialogue took place. And you could look at it on YouTube. There were more than 500 people in the auditorium that night. The place was packed. And many of them were Jews. And the leader, the head of the Jewish community in, in, in Cape Town, was sitting in the front row. And the dialogue that took place between the Christian bishop and myself went off so well it was so pleasant no one throwing stones at each other no because i can have a friendly dialogue with someone who is not my enemy and when you look at that recording on youtube you'll see 
Uh, he held his position, I held my position. And we had a very interesting dialogue. And the audience applauded us over and over again. At the end, they were so happy. And the only people who were very angry that night was the leader of the Jewish community. Because they lost the bus. They were not there. You see? So the answer is that we are not prohibited for maintaining friendly ties with Christians and Jews who do not belong to that Judeo-Christian life. I think we have covered a brief introduction on eschatology. So, um, if everyone is comfortable, maybe you would like to, for me, I would like to see the importance and how it relates to our field currently. You cannot understand the world of politics today without Islamic eschatology. You cannot understand the world of economics today, and monetary economics today, without Islamic eschatology. You'd be surprised. Because of Islamic eschatology, we know that tomorrow the world is going to use gold and silver coins as money. No monetary economists Economists anticipate that now, but eschatology allows us to understand that there's a tomorrow which is coming when the world will go return to gold and silver coins as money. And I have prayed to Allah to kindly take me away from the world. I don't want to live to see that day because the shame and the disgrace will be too great for me. That my people still remain with the bogus and fraudulent and utterly haram paper currencies which has come from that Jewish Christian Zionist alliance and with even more haram electronic money and we have abandoned the dinar and dirham which is in the Quran and which is in the Sunnah and only when they, the rest of the world, when they return to gold and silver, then we slavishly return with them. I don't want to live to see that day because the shame and disgrace will be too great for me. But those who will not do anything, and they have the capacity to speak, they have the status in society to be able to speak, but they will not speak. And they will do nothing to restore gold, dinar, and silver dirham as money. Oh Allah, keep them alive. Even if they have to live and win walking sticks, keep them alive. So they will witness that moment of shame and disgrace for this Ummah. It is this subject which explains that phenomenon of monetary economics that I have spoken about. But let us look at the political side. How important is Islamic eschatology when we apply it to understanding the politics of today? We are at the moment on the verge, on the brink. Maybe we have two or three months left. That's all before an attack is launched on Iran. Huh? If you want to launch a military attack on a country and your goal is essentially military, then common sense is that you want it to be a surprise attack. So when you're broadcasting Seven days a week, 24 day hours of the day, you are broadcasting that you're going to attack Iran. And you're doing it for years now. It should be clear that your primary goal is not military. No. Your primary goal is, for example, political and other goals, but not military. What? would be the consequences of an attack on Iran. I say to you, it is only Islamic eschatology that will allow you to understand this subject and analyze it 
in a manner which even the experts in political science in the Western world cannot do. One of the most important things of all of an attack on Iran, and which the American armed forces understand very well, is that an Israeli attack on Iran is going to eventually provoke a world war. The U.S. armed forces have no problem <laughs> with attacking Libya. Uh, it's a little tough. It's a piece of cake, they call it. It's a walkover. But Russia? Oh no. Not Russia. Because if you have war with Russia, it's going to be nuclear warfare. Mm -hmm. And large numbers of American cities are going to be reduced to ashes. The American armed forces understand that. And so they don't want an attack on Iran because of the implication that it is eventually going to lead to world war. But Israel is insistent. Israel doesn't care. Israel doesn't mind the world being destroyed. The Zionists don't care for that. World war or no world war, we're going to proceed. <laughs> That coming conflict, because now the attack on Iran is almost certain, that coming, co coming conflict between the two giants, the Russian-led alliance, which I believe China is going to be part of it, both nuclear power, and the Western alliance, is going to devastate the world. Thousands of nuclear weapons are going to be used if Iran is attacked. The American armed forces understand that. They know it. And so we're looking maybe how much, 20 years from now, that events will unfold in such a way that the world war will take place. Many of you will say, no, not 20, much less than that, if Iran is attacked. Does the Quran speak about an event which will destroy all cities at all times? Is there anything in the Quran about that? Yes, in Surah Al Isra. Wa in min qariyatin. Wa in min qariyatin. Illa nahnu muhlikuha qabla yawm al qiyamah. Qabla yawm il qiyama. Qabla yawm il qiyama. There's not a single town or city that we will not destroy before the end of the world. O mu'azzimuha azaban shadeela. O punish with terrible punishment. Kana thalika fil kitabi mastura. And this is something inscribed in the book. <coughs> My study of the subject of Gog and Magog uh, and I wrote the book, which I, it has not as yet been approved for Brunei, but we hope it will be approved soon, inshallah. An Islamic view of Gog and Magog in the modern world. That subject allows me to anticipate a clash between Gog and Magog. And that coming world war, I can therefore anticipate, will destroy the towns and the cities. And as a consequence, I've been telling my students, move out of the towns and cities and go to the remote countryside. And make sure you have food and you have water. And you know that you are in a remote countryside when you're out of electronic range. Because once you're within electronic range, you'll be incinerated. So if you can use a, tel a cell phone, keep on going. <laughs> if, 
<laughs> you're not yet in the remote countryside. But there are many more immediate implications. <clears throat> this one may be 20 years away from now. Hmm? The Russian-American clash of the giants. There are many more implications of an event which is around the corner. The attack on Iran is believe, it, I believe, will be used to provoke Sunni Shia civil war in the world of Islam. And so you will find that over the last few years one particularly group, one particular group of Muslims has been vociferous in his attack on the Shias, declaring them to be kuffar and declaring them to be wicked and declaring that they are the Zionist agents and all these kinds of things. Whereas Shia and Sunni have lived together in many parts of the world in peace and harmony, yes, and yet you have this wicked attack being launched. And Shia Iran is supporting the Palestinian. And Shia Iran is standing up to the United States and standing up to Israel. And yet the attack on the Shia is so vicious. I am under attack as well, because I would not say that the Shia are kuffar. And so I am saying to you that as soon as the attack on Iran is launched, look to see the flames of Sunni Shia uh, civil war in the world of Islam, which will create immense problems for Pakistan, for example. <laughs> there are other implications. The Sunnis believe that Imam al-Mahdi will come. The Shia believe that Imam al-Mahdi will come. Hmm? Fag is their Imam. And when we say no Imam al Mahdi is not going to be Shia, oh no, they're quite surprised by the statement. I anticipate that an Imam al Mahdi has already been groomed and trained so that as soon as Israel attacks Iran, they're going to bring him out of the closet. And the world of Islam is going to be surprised by this propaganda offensive now. Imam al-Mahdi is here. Of course he is not the Imam al-Mahdi. Imam al-Mahdi will not emerge for maybe another 20, 25 years. When the Isa al islam is still just before that. <laughs> this is Islamic eschatology at work. An attack on Iran is going to provoke Iran to retaliate. Iran can block oil shipments from the Persian Gulf. So what's going to happen to the price of oil as soon as Israel attacks? The price of oil is going to shoot up to the sky. And what's going to happen to the US dollar? Oh, you don't need a PhD to understand that. The US dollar is already on the verge of collapse. It will not survive an Israeli attack on Iran. The US dollar will collapse. And when the US dollar collapses, they will have to demonetize it meaning you cannot use U.S. dollars for buying and selling. Where does Imran Hussein get this knowledge from? I'll tell you where. It's from Islamic eschatology. That's where. And they'll have to introduce some other money to use for microtransactions, and electronic money will be there for the rest. But when the U.S. dollar collapses, there's going to be massive loss of wealth in the United States for white America. Black America doesn't really have money. And these people are not going to take it sitting down. And you know, most Americans have guns. And they don't use it as firecrackers. Eh? No. 
So when that crash of the dollar comes and the demonetization of the dollar, look out for riots in the United States. If you want to replace the United States as the next ruling state in the world, when you see the U.S. dollar crashes and you see riots in the United States, you'll be smiling, won't you? <laughs> huh? Come on. Because your goal is to replace the United States. Why would Israel want to replace the United States as the next ruling state in the world? Only Jerusalem in the Quran explains that. Only Islamic eschatology explains that. This is politics. If Iran is attacked, it's not just oil. It's not just the dollar. But more than that, I am anticipating that Iran will be given the green light to take Bahrain. Because it's just across the water. Bahrain cannot defend itself from Iran. Within the first few hours, perhaps, of that attack, Iran will take Bahrain. <laughs> Between Bahrain and United, uh, um, Saudi Arabia, there's a causeway. You could drive. <laughs> so once you take Bahrain, Saudi Arabia is in peril. Can Saudi Arabia defend itself against Iran? No, I don't think so at all. So what will the Saudis do? Answer? There's more on this subject that I can talk, but I choose not. I'm going to be silent for the moment. You're not going to get the whole story from me today. <laughs> Saudi Arabia will call on the United States for help. Forcing the United States against its will, against its will, to intervene militarily in Saudi Arabia against Iran. A Saudi, uh, an American armed forces is already stretched out to the limit all over the world. And I anticipate that Iran will be giving the, the Americans a beating of their life. Yeah? And the United States will be facing a critical milita military situation where defeat can be imminent. And the only way the United States can be saved from defeat is if Israel intervenes. This is scripted. This is scripted. When Israel intervenes to save the United States, the writing is on the wall. Israel is taking over from the United States as the next ruling state in the world. <coughs> I don't know whether this will happen. But I'm offering you an analysis of a possibility. At the back of all of this is the movement from Britain as one ruling state, when you had Pax Britannica, which did not happen by accident, to the United States as a second ruling state, you had Pax Americana, which did not happen by accident. To the third ruling state, and last one, Israel, Pax Judaica. Why does Israel want to rule the world? Only Nabi Muhammad Islam could answer that question. Because he spoke 1400 years ago and told us that there would be a man who would impersonate the true Messiah and therefore declare himself to be the true Messiah when he would not be. He would be the false Messiah. And I'm talking too much in this session now. In order for him to successfully impersonate the true Messiah, since the true Messiah has to rule the world from Jerusalem, he has <coughs> to rule the world from Jerusalem. And he is the job. And I am so pleased that I'm getting emails from American scholars 
who are not Muslims, asking for more information about the Jah. The emails are coming. Because it's clear that the one who truly can explain the world today is Prophet Muhammad And so in studying Islamic eschatology, and in using the Quran and the Ahadith of Nabi Muhammad to explain reality today, there must be plenty barakah. The heavens will be pleased with you for doing this work. So let me stop talking now. I've talked too much. There's much more to the subject. I've not as yet taught you who is Dajjal. I've not taught you what is Gog and Magog. I've not spoken about the return of Jesus in detail. I've not spoken about Imam al -Mahdi. I've not spoken about the army which will come from Khorasan and the conflict between Muslims and Jews. Huh? I've not spoke, spoken about the conquest of Constantinople which is coming. Constantinople is now known as Istanbul. I've not spoken about the alliance with Rome which is prophesied in the Ahadith. All of this is part of Islamic eschatology. Now then, any questions? Yeah. Is there anything in uh, Islamic eschatology related to the education system in this present world? Hmm. Good question. Who can answer that? Who wants to try? I give you a hint. So little calf of the Quran. Come on, somebody. And the pursuit of knowledge. In Akhirul Zaman. Surah Al Kafi of the Quran. Come on, somebody. There are only four stories in Surah Al Kafi. Which the last, one? The last story. The last one. The last one is Al Karnain. That's the last one. The first one is the young man in the cave. And the, cave. Mm -hmm. the second one is it? Rich man and, man and the poor man. The third one is Musa and the Kedah. Come on, tell me which one. <coughs> one who asks the question, then you give me the answer. Uh, I think it's the uh, Musa and... Correct! <laughs> Correct! <laughs> it's not by accident that the story of Mu or the event of Musa alayhi salam and Khidr alayhi salam was sent down and sent down in Surah al kafi of the Quran. This passage is the most important passage in the whole Quran teaching us methodology for the study of Akhir Zaman. <coughs> this is the surah of Islamic eschatology, Surah al kafi and this has been widely known in the world of Islam for more than a thousand years now. That this is the Surah of Akhir zaman Why? The Jal is not mentioned in the Quran by name. That's part of the literary beauty of the Quran. An Arab would understand. Sometimes you send a message without speaking. Huh? You can send a message to someone without speaking. An unspoken word, just a sign is enough. Huh? Uh, the, I, I quoted last night at a private home an expression that my teacher used in Urdu. Molana Dr. Fadur Rahman Ansari Rahimahullah. He said, Akalman ke liye ishara kafi hai. 
<laughs> For the one who is intelligent, you don't need to do more than simply give a sign, and you'll understand. <laughs> okay? So this is part of literary beauty and literary excellence that sometimes you teach a subject without actually using words, but sending signs. And so while the Dajjal is not in the Qur'an by name, there are lots of signs in the Qur'an for those who are intelligent. And Nabi Muhammad said, recite the first ten verses of Surah al kafi for protection from the fitna of the Dajjal. So you should at least memorize the first ten, okay? This is the only surah of the Qur'an linked by the Prophet himself, alayhi salatu wasalam, with the Jah. <coughs> Secondly, this is the surah of the Qur'an that introduces the subject of Gagad Magad. So this is the surah of Islamic eschatology. And it is in this surah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us the encounter between Musa alayhi salam and Khidr alayhi salam. And he says about Khidr alayhi salam, وَعَلَّمْنَاهُ مِنْ لَدُنَّ عِلْمًا The knowledge does not come only from external observation and experimentation and rational inquiry. You're doing your PhD. Knowledge does not come only externally. <laughs> Knowledge also comes internally. Every scientist knows that. Scientists make amazing diff discoveries of science because of insight, a flash of insight. Hmm? Because you've done your homework and then Allah blessed you with a flash of insight. So knowledge for us comes not only externally but also internally. The heart, when it has noor in it, the heart can see what otherwise cannot be seen. And if the heart cannot see, even if you're driving a BMW outside or Mercedes Benz, I see a lot of them in Brunei. If the heart cannot see, then Allah says of you, you're just like cattle. You're worse than cattle. Huh? So a warning is given about knowledge and education in Akhir Zaman. That in order to penetrate the reality of the world in Akhir Zaman, you need more than external knowledge. You also need internal knowledge. But Surah al kaf of the Quran, in the story of Musa alayhi salam and Khidr alayhi salam, tells us that the one who has the capacity, the intellectual capacity, to penetrate reality, you'll find him only at that place where the two Help me. The two, the two oceans meet. Correct. Majma'ul Bahrain. Majma'ul Bahrain. Where the two oceans meet. Imam Baydawi, rahimahullah, is the only Mufassir who has explained and interpreted. He says that the ocean. The two oceans are the ocean of knowledge, externally acquired, and the ocean of knowledge, internally received. The ocean of knowledge, externally acquired, and the ocean of knowledge, internally received. And that these two oceans of knowledge should not exist as two separate oceans but rather they must come together 
Majma'ul Bahrain they must come together to form an integrated organic whole. When you pursue that knowledge with such a teacher and you do not as yet have that insight then the teacher has to say to the student are you listening? You can stay with me as a student, but don't ask me any questions. <laughs> don't ask any questions. So this is a different methodology now. Oh, no question until I explain to you. Huh? And Musa Islam said, I want to follow you. So I can learn from what Allah has given to you. Do you know what he said to him? <coughs> These two ayats of Surah al kafi are so important. Mm. Try to get it on a plaque and put it on the wall of your room, your home. So you see it every day. Innaka lanta stadiya ma'ayya sabra wa kaifa tasbiru ala ma lam tuhid bihi khubra You will not be able to show patience with me in the study of this subject. Now, and how can you show patience in respect of that which lies beyond your comprehension? And so the rational inquiry, the experimental method, the externally acquired knowledge cannot on its own penetrate ilmu akhiru zaman. That's the difference in methodology. We have some time. Ten more minutes, yes. Uh, there is one hadith that uh, uh, in the end time uh, there, uh, there is a uh, supposed to be age of uh, uh, fitna and it is said that uh, when that age of fitna comes so the Muslims or the people should uh, they need to you know, be isolated from the population and even the example is given that be like a doormat so don't go anywhere and just protect your Iman so how we identify that age of uh, fitna this is part of the part of the process of teaching the Sati Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam spoke of this age of fitna the fitna of Dajjal and he said that this will be the greatest fitna that mankind will experience from the time of Adam alayhi salam to the last day. Hmm? The age of fitan. It mentioned in the hadith, fitan. How would you know that the age of fitan has arrived? That you're now living in akhirul zaman. Well, the first one I'm going to give you, if you can't recognize it, I suggest you go to visit an optician get a pair of spectacles. When the angel came to the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam and asked the five questions, do you remember them? Yes. Come on, shake your hands. The five questions? Or oh, some of you don't know. Number one, what is Islam? Number two, what is al iman? Number three, what is al ihsan? Number four, when will the hour come? And number five, what are the alama to What are the signs of the hour? He answered number five and he said, okay, who can help me? Adi? What is the answer? Ten signs. Ten signs. They? Ten signs. No, 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 no. When the angel Gabriel came, 
alayhi salam. No, not you, you, you. Anyway, he gave two signs. What were they? Yes? No? Come on, somebody. The rise of sun from the... The sun will rise from the west. No. Yes, Brother Muhammad? The? Anybody else? Yeah? People are competing and building in a hut. See? Don't let the cat out of the back here. Huh? A slave woman will give birth to her mistress. That's correct. That's one. And tell it that Amma to Rabbata. That's what. And you cannot understand that and you cannot explain that without Ilmu Akhil Zaman. The slave woman is already giving a birth to her mistress now. But what is the other one? Brother Muhammad was just on the verge of telling us that you'd find the naked, barefooted shepherds Petronas is not going to be happy with me now. Right? <laughs> Competing with each other in the construction of tall buildings. And may Allah bless Sultan Omar Ali Saifuddin Rahimahullah. This is the first and only place in the world I've ever heard. The only place on Allah's earth I've ever heard. Where Sultan spoke with such wisdom. And he said, No building must be taller than the height of the minaret. May Allah bless that Sultan. May Allah bless that Sultan. So you can be comfortable in Mandar Sri Bhagavad. Because there are no tall buildings. But once you leave and you go to KL, take a taxi. And head for KLCC. And you see the tall buildings. Huh? And if you can't see the tall buildings, then go and have your eyes examined. <laughs> so here are signs that are plainly visible that you are living in Akhir Zaman. Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam said, that in Akhir zaman women were dressed like men. He said it. Today I see them, I call it the blue jeans, Jamaat. <laughs> he said that women would be dressed and yet be naked. How long do we have to wait for that? Another hundred years, two hundred years? Or is it already here? He said, all of mankind will be consuming riba. And if anyone claims he's not consuming riba, verily the dust of riba would be on him. The vapor of riba would be on him. Has that come? Or do we have to wait a thousand years? So the answer to your question is, yes, we are already in Akhir zaman and in Akhir zaman Nabi Muhammad said the time will come when a believer in order to preserve his faith will have to flee to the mountain side where rain falls and take with him some sheep and goat meaning withdrawal withdrawal from the godless decadent oppressive cities of the world and Surah Al-Kafir of the Quran I'm using the Malay, trans Malay pronunciation all the time Surah Al-Kaf of the Qur'an tells us at the very beginning about the young man who fled, who cut off their ties and withdrew from the cities in order to preserve faith. And so yes, when you find that you cannot preserve faith in the city, you've got to get out. The money that we are using came from the Dajjal. This money that we are using came from the Dajjal. Every time we use this money, we have the stamp of Dajjal upon us. How can we stop using this money and use the R and Dirham? I think Brunei has a better chance of succeeding. 
than many, many other parts of the world if we can have men of courage in this country. Men of courage and integrity to stand up and help the Sultan. If you cannot get away from it, leave and go and build a micro market in the countryside, the remote Nigerian countryside. And in that market, you prohibit the bogus money and return to only gold and silver coins with money. And then you will survive. <laughs>